Hey everybody, Rick Howard here, the CyberWire's Chief Security Officer, Chief Analyst, and Senior Fellow. I want to remind you that I will be hosting the CyberWire's Quarterly Analyst Call this Friday from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I've invited two experts to the CyberWire hash table to discuss the most impactful stories from the last 90 days. Roselle Safran, the CEO and founder at Key Caliber, and William McMillan, the former CISO for the CIA and currently the SVP of Security Product and Program Management at Salesforce. And you all know as regular listeners that cyber news comes in fast and furious and in large volumes. It's hard to tell what's important and what's not. In this show, we're going to hit the pause button and try to figure it out. Come join us. It's always fun, and you might learn a thing or two. You can register at the CyberWire's website. Just click the register button at the top of the page that says CW Pro Q3 Analyst Call. And I hope to see you there. This episode of the CyberWire is made possible in part by SpyCloud. Stolen data circulating on the criminal underground is fuel for data breaches, account takeover, ransomware attacks, and online fraud. Your biggest security risk might be a breach or malware infection outside of your control that exposes the data of your users. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data sourced from the dark web that power solutions that proactively protect over 3 billion employees and consumer accounts worldwide. Learn how to make recaptured data your best defense at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. Gray Hat support for Iranian dissidents, selling access wholesale in the C2C market. Novel malware has been discovered targeting VMware hypervisors. The Wichity Espionage Group uses an updated toolkit. Deepin Desai from Zscaler has a technical analysis of industrial spy ransomware. Ann Johnson of Afternoon Cyber Tea speaks with Mikhail Braverman Blumenstick, CTO for Microsoft Security, about Israel's cyber innovation and Russian troops' phone call revelations. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, September 29th, 2022. Hacktivists and others are seeking to render aid to Iranian dissidents and protesters. Researchers from Checkpoint report. Much of the activity is directed at facilitating communication and coordination among groups opposed to the regime in Tehran, but there's also some direct hacking of government-related sites and data, with signs of some profit-taking on the side. Checkpoint says key activities are data leaking and selling, including officials' phone numbers and emails, and maps of sensitive locations. Cyber6 Gill has published a report looking at network access for sale on underground markets. The researchers say there are two broad categories of access as a service for sale on the underground. Initial access brokers, which auction access to companies for hundreds to thousands of dollars, and wholesale access markets, which sell access to compromised endpoints for around $10. Wholesale access markets are flea markets. The prices are low, the inventory is enormous, and the quality is not guaranteed, as listings could belong to a random individual user or an enterprise endpoint. The researchers found that wholesale access markets have played a large role in providing initial access for ransomware attackers. About a fifth of ransomware attacks are facilitated by initial access markets. Mandiant has identified new malware that targets VMware ESXi, Linux vCenter servers, and Windows virtual machines. They're able to maintain persistent administrative access to the hypervisor with all the capabilities that suggests. Mandiant has attributed this malware to UNC 3886, suspecting that the motivation is cyber espionage 
with a possible connection to China. VMware has used the information Mandiant developed to prepare guidance for its users. Researchers at Securonics Threat Labs have issued a report on a cyber espionage campaign they're calling Steep Maverick. They call it a covert attack campaign, and they conclude that its targets have been multiple military and weapons contractor companies, including likely a strategic supplier to the F-35 Lightning II fighter aircraft. The PowerShell stager the threat actor used isn't particularly novel, but the procedures involved feature an array of interesting tactics, persistence methodology, counter-forensics, and layers upon layers of obfuscation to hide its code. Securonics describes the phishing email as being similar to one it had encountered in a campaign earlier this year involving North Korea's APT-37 threat group. As has become commonplace with cyber espionage campaigns, Steep Maverick begins with a phishing email, the hook buried in an attached .inc file with an anodyne fishbait name like Company and Benefits. Once installed, the malware is unusually persistent. There's no attribution, but one circumstantial detail is suggestive. If the system's language is set to Chinese or Russian, then the code will simply exit and the computer will shut down. The Symantec Threat Hunter team released a blog today detailing the Wichity Espionage Group, also known as Looking Frog, and their updated toolset. Wichity has been seen to be targeting the governments of two Middle Eastern countries, as well as the stock exchange for a nation in Africa. Wichity has been using the Look Back back door, but it appears new malware has been added to the group's toolkit. A backdoor trojan known as backdoor.stegmap has been seen in use using steganography, a technique in which malicious code is hidden in an image. The payload can create and remove directories, copy files, move files, and delete files, start a new process, download and run an executable and terminate this process, steal local files, enumerate and kill processes and read, create, and delete registry keys, as well as setting a registry key value. Symantec doesn't offer an attribution, but it does quote ESET's association of Wichity with TA-410, a group other researchers have associated with China's Ministry of State Security. One general lesson military services have drawn from Russia's war against Ukraine is that the ubiquity of mobile devices and their easy access to the Internet have combined to create a new world for OPSEC, for operational security. That is, no one has so far figured out how to keep matters secure when individuals now have communication capabilities that 50 years ago would have been the envy of a national command authority. Local citizens with cell phones taking pictures of deploying Russian units in both Russia and Belarus gave journalists, enthusiasts, and lay observers a tolerably complete picture of the Russian order of battle on the eve of the invasion of Ukraine. Now they're affording insight into the state of morale in the Russian forces, and it's not a pretty picture. Ukrainian intelligence and law enforcement agencies intercepted and recorded many of the calls Russian troops made from the zone of attack beginning in the early days of the invasion— and the New York Times has published an extensive selection of them. The soldiers complain of their leader's failure to even tell them they were being deployed to combat, of tactical ineptitude, supply failure, and often with horror of the widespread atrocities committed by their forces. A representative call early in the invasion recounted the futility of Russian attempts to take Kiev in a decapitation operation. The caller stating, we can't take Kiev. we just take villages, and that's it. Other calls reflected the shifting fortunes of the battlefield as the war turned against Russia. Tanks and armored carriers were burning. They blew up a bridge and a dam. The roads flooded. Now we can't move. Casualties are said to be high. From my regiment alone, one-third of the regiment, one soldier told a family member. A common view of the war is that it was founded on lies. As one soldier said to his mother, Mom, we haven't seen a single fascist here. The war is based on a false pretense. No one needed it. We got here and people were living normal lives. Very well, like in Russia. And now they have to live in basements. The old lady who lived near us had to live in the cellar. 
Can you imagine? There's a great deal more like this. President Putin himself comes in for a great deal of adverse comment. Given the increasingly hands-on role he's played as he's progressively lost confidence in his combat commanders and the military and intelligence establishments generally, that frontline odium seems fair enough. The authenticity of the intercepts seems beyond question. The Times wrote, Reporters verified the authenticity of these calls by cross-referencing the Russian phone numbers with messaging apps and social media profiles to identify soldiers and family members, adding that they'd spent almost two months translating the recordings, which have been edited for clarity and length. All soldiers gripe in every army, at all times and in all places, but what's being heard in the intercepted phone calls goes well beyond the soldierly norms of grousing, discontent, and the customary sense of being underappreciated and ill-used. Russia's army has a serious morale problem. That problem is rooted in loss of confidence in the chain of command and a recognition that the army's training and logistics have been utterly inadequate to its mission. And finally, Ukraine has warned that Russia is preparing a fresh wave of attacks. While Russian cyber operations have underperformed in the war, in part because defenses have proved more effective than expected, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, has tweeted a reminder that relaxation of vigilance would at this point be premature. So, shields up. Coming up after the break, Deep into Sai from Zscaler has a technical analysis of industrial spy ransomware. Ann Johnson of the Afternoon Cyber Tea Podcast speaks with Mikhail Braverman Blumenstick, CTO for Microsoft Security, about Israel's cyber innovation. Stay with us. And now, a word from our sponsors, Know Before. So, what's a con game? It's a fraud that works by getting the victim to misplace their confidence in the con artist. In the world of security, we call confidence tricks social engineering. And as our sponsors at Know Before can tell you, human error is how most organizations get compromised. Where there's human contact, there can be con games. It's important to build the kind of security culture in which your employees are enabled to make smart security decisions. To do that, they need new school security awareness training. See how your security culture stacks up against Know Before's free phishing test. Get it at knowbefore.com slash phishing test. That's knowbefore.com slash phishing test. And we thank Know Before for sponsoring our show. And now, a word from our sponsor, Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution that uses the most powerful untapped resource in IT, end users. Legacy device management tools like MDMs force disruptive agents onto employee devices that slow performance and treat privacy as an afterthought. Collide does things differently. Instead of forcing changes, Collide notifies your team via Slack when their devices are insecure and gives them step-by-step instructions to solve the issue. Collide can help you build a culture where everyone contributes to security because everyone understands how and why to do it. For IT admins, Collide provides a single dashboard that lets you monitor the security of your entire fleet, whether they're running on Mac, Windows, or Linux. That visibility makes it easier to prove compliance to your auditors, customers, and leadership. You can meet your compliance goals by putting users first. Visit collide.com slash cyberwire daily to find out how. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash cyberwire daily. And we thank Collide for sponsoring our show. Johnson is host of the Afternoon Cyber Tea Podcast. In a recent episode, she spoke with McCall Braverman Blumenstick, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft Security, about Israel's cyber innovation. 
Israel has been a long center for cyber innovation, and some of those cutting-edge technology companies come from Israel. So tell us why that's the case. What makes Israel so special? So first of all, you are absolutely right. There is a lot of innovation in in cybersecurity and in high tech in general that comes from uh, Israel. As a matter of fact, you know, Israel is not a big country. It's only is less than nine million people, which is uh, about 0.1% of the world population. But if we look at the investment in cyber, the investment in cyber are in Israel are 38% of all global investments in cyber, which I find amazing. As we think about then, you know, the, the wonderful work that you're leading in ILDC and the work that you're doing as the CTO for the cybersecurity business at Microsoft, let's talk a little bit about ecosystem because I know you spend a lot of time talking to customers, partners, founders, startups, venture capitalists, et cetera. What are you hearing from them now? What do you think some of the trends are and what are the leader, you know, what is keeping our security leaders up at night? It's interesting that when I look at the ecosystem and and all the, our customers and partners, uh, I find that they become more and more educated on on cyber threats and on cybersecurity in general. And the more they become educated, the more worried they are, the more sleep they lose at night. And 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 for and and, and I understand that. And let's focus on some of the trends that bother the ecosystem. So first of all, attacks are becoming more sophisticated. They're becoming more sophisticated, not only because the the attackers are technology savvy and they have the most amazing technology. As a matter of fact, it's almost a mirror picture of the technologies that we are using in, 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 in the good part of the industry, but they're also leveraging sophisticated business models and they create their own ecosystem. So it's really a, a whole in very sophisticated industry. Part of that role, I know, is looking into the future and determine what technology and engineering investments Microsoft needs to make, how to empower our customers, how to keep our customers successful. So what has you excited? What technology are you thinking about right now? So first of all, cybersecurity is very exciting. The reason it's so exciting, it's like playing chess. You have an opponent. When you just develop software, you don't have an opponent. You just have to develop good software. However, when you uh, develop and design cybersecurity products, you always uh, you have you always have to be one step ahead of your opponent. You can hear more of this interview and indeed the entire library of afternoon Cyber Tea podcasts right here on the CyberWire Podcast Network. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Deepan Desai. He is the Chief Information Security Officer and VP of Security Research and Operations at Zscaler. Uh, Deepan, always great to welcome you back to the show. I want to touch base with you today about some research that you and your colleagues have posted. You all ha- had an eye on the industrial spy ransomware. What's going on here? Thanks, Dave. Uh, so industrial spy is a relatively new ransomware group that emerged in April 2022. Uh, in some instances, uh, when the team was tracking this group, uh, it appeared that they were only exfiltrating and uh, ransoming based on the data. Uh, while in some of the other cases, they were actually going through the file encryption, exfiltration, and then uh, demanding ransom. Now, if you look at the history of this group, the industrial spy started as a data extortion marketplace where criminals could buy large companies' internal data. They pr- actually promoted this marketplace using uh, a readme.txt file uh, that were downloaded using malware downloaders disguised as cracks, adware. Um, um, and, and after these initial promotional campaigns, what we're now starting to see is the threat group has introduced their own ransomware to create uh, uh, these double extortion attacks. That's interesting. What what are some of the key things that uh, that drew your attention to this group? Any any particular ways they stand out? Yeah. So um, I think 
the the change in the tactic i already outlined where they started with only focusing on data to going full blown um uh, you know ransomware double extortion attacks uh we also noticed that before they release their own version of ransomware they briefly tried cuba ransomware family and and uh, probably they ended up deciding uh, having to code their own payload in may of 2022 The threat group does exfiltrate and sells data on their dark web, um, right? As as I mentioned, so they already have the infrastructure for for the uh, selling of data and monetizing that piece. The ransomware utilizes a combination of uh, triple DES and RSA uh, to encrypt the files on the mm-hmm. victim machine. We did notice that uh, you know industrial spy lacks many common features which are present in um, modern ransomware families and and that's where again I'll club this into in development uh, malware family uh, many of the commonly seen nt analysis and obfuscation techniques uh, are are missing so it was it was relatively easy for uh, our analysts to reverse and you know dissect uh, the payload that was observed What sort of velocity does it seem as though they're running here? Or are they a particularly active group? Yeah, so in terms of payloads, uh, we're not seeing that many new payloads. Uh, there are very few payloads we've seen so far. Um, we're, we're tracking all the public sources as well, like things like virus total and um, uh, as well as things that we're seeing in the cloud. Uh, the number of new unique payloads are fairly low, but we're still noticing the group is consistently adding two to three new victims. every month on their data leak portal so they are uh, they are enjoying success in terms of successfully uh, infiltrating some of these organizations it's interesting to me that they decided to you know roll their own ransomware here and particularly when you think about how many ransomware as a service offerings are out there uh to take the effort to do this so, i mean is, does that strike you as interesting as well Yeah, it is interesting, uh, but then again, in in this case, because these are uh, th- this group appears to know uh, the in and out of the operations already, so they're trying to control their own destiny by holding the source of the ransom and adding updates and features that match their their operation style. So we we do expect this threat group uh, will continue to stay active uh, at least in the near future with more updates and features getting added in the payloads. All right, interesting stuff. Well, deep and decide. Thanks so much for joining us. We want to thank our sponsor Keeper Security for helping make this episode possible. Keeper is the world's most secure password manager for organizations. Funding for this podcast is made possible by Mwise, the Mandiant Worldwide Information Security Exchange, a new vendor-neutral conference event for security practitioners from Mandiant. Gather intel and learn best practices from security experts. October 18th through the 20th in Washington DC or online. Learn more at mwise.mandiant.com. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at the cyberwire.com. The Cyberwire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing Cyberwire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Liz Irvin, Rachel Gelfin, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpy, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. I'm Gina Johnson, contributing writer and operations associate at the Cyberwire. 
After a two-year hiatus, we are so excited to be able to bring together women in the industry to celebrate and empower each other. Whether you're a CDSM veteran or just starting out in cybersecurity, we are thrilled to invite you to join us on October 20th, 2022 at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. for an evening of networking and camaraderie across the industry with women in different points in their careers. Visit thecyberwire.com slash WCS to find out more or request an invitation. Hope to see you there.